This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Some of the early pioneers talked about riding through the state and actually having to stand on the backs of horses to see over the grasses. He's not talking about someone too lazy to mow the lawn. He's talking about habitat and how it used to be when many, many, many more species called Kentucky home than can today. We go inside outdoors with wildlife biologist Dan Feigert to talk about what's out there. It might be different than what you think. All next on Kentucky Field Radio. Swimming has taken me around the world. Olympic swimming gold medalist, Rachel Komazar. It's a thrill to swim for your country, but it's another to swim for your life. In a boating accident, that's what happens. It can happen to you. You could be hurt, dazed, unconscious. Being a good swimmer isn't good enough. When fun turns frantic, trust me, your life jacket is as good as gold. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back and the backing of the best swimmers everywhere. I'm on to him, Kate. If he says 10, he's lying. You poor thing. It's mostly about fishing. He caught 10 fish in 10 minutes, or it weighed 10 pounds, like right. Well, what about when he says you're a perfect 10? Did I say it's mostly about fishing? (laughs) Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, fishing's not about math. It's about fun. And fudge it a little if you need to. Kentucky Fishing. Be honest. It'll make a liar out of you. This is Charlie Bagman in on Kentucky Field Radio. You know you can learn a lot from nature, and you can also learn from nature a lot about people. Here's how. As times have changed from pre-settlement days when uh, the country was home pretty much to the Native Americans, and then the onslaught of pilgrims, westward expansion, industrial revolution, and everybody needed the timber to build a big house, and the land and the fields have changed. The land changed faster than the animals, the fish, the birds could really keep up. That's the thesis statement of the show this week, and many may not realize that. You take a look out, and the forests and the fields we have today, you assume, are the ones we have always had. Well, not necessarily. It's worth a discussion, and we chose Dan Feigert, who is the assistant director of the Kentucky Division of Wildlife. But he's a fellow I have known for many years, and he has this uncanny knack of being able to translate biology and ecology into English. Dan, I have many notes here in front of me, and I don't know really where to start, but since nature is so interconnected, I guess the conversation could start anywhere. And it ends anywhere. The landscape in Kentucky, it's changed throughout history. It's always been impacted by various things, whether it was Native Americans or climate or whatever. To me, it's hard to try to pick a point that you want to go back to. I want to go back to pre-European settlement. I want to go back to... You know, because the in- Indians had a huge impact on wildlife in the habitat. So it's it's hard to pick a point in time if you want to try to mimic it. What point do you pick? Because it's it's really changed throughout, I think, in my opinion. There was a time when passenger pigeons blackened the sky. Yeah. There was a time when bison were out there so thick you could not uh, count them. And prairie chickens across Kentucky. Those days have gone. Yeah. And I think that when that occurred... You had a landscape that was maintained um, not only by the animals, but also by the Native Americans that occurred here, and probably much larger numbers than when European settlement came here. Um, They burned regularly for a lot of reasons, um, but I think a lot of it was to try to create the right habitat, but also to try to funnel wildlife and to try to make sure that they had the critters here that they needed to survive. It was such a different landscape. We had, you know, savannas, acres and acres of thousands, millions of acres of grasslands in savannas. It was not the forested landscape that when Daniel Boone came through, he saw. The evidence of that is that there were buffalo here. There were prairie chickens here. There were elk here. There were grassland species in vast numbers. And the only way to have those species is to have grasslands. And the only way in this climate that grasslands could be maintained was by regular fire. Um, And probably, it's hard to say, but probably the Native Americans burned it whenever they could. Whenever it was dry enough, they would probably light a fire. And it would burn until it went out. You know, there were no roads to stop it. There were no 
U.S. Forest Service to stop it. It just burned. And I'm sure they learned how and when to burn that they got the impact with the habitat and the critter response that they needed or wanted to see. Grasslands, you talk about, and people, anyone hearing this program would say, well, what's the difference between a grassland and a regular old field? And there are some differences. We want to spend this hour talking about what we may think we know about wildlife and habitat and kind of what the truth is. Well, our landscape is just completely different than it was. What is the same about the landscape the, from a thousand years ago? More or less, the topography is the same. Um, the rivers still carry about the same amount of water, although it's in different types of flows. Trees, I guess, the same, same trees. And same houses. species of trees for the most part. I mean, there's a few changes that have occurred, but for the most part, the same tree species are here. You know, we have very few blue ash, for example, in the bluegrass area. Um, we have no American chestnut. So there are some changes even in the, the tree component, but, but for the basic part, the oak and hickory that we typically see, um, we expect were here back then as well. Wetlands have declined greatly. We still have a few of those along the Ohio River and down along the Mississippi. And throughout the state. But yeah, the that was an easy area for farmers to go in, early farmers to go in and try to drain. And they had great soil. Um, so if they could get the water off or change the water just a little bit, dry them out just a little bit, they grew great crops. And so that was one of the early changes. And they were flat, so they were easy for early farmers to try to utilize. Talking about what is still the same, the words grasslands has come up. They looked different back in the day. Yes, now, very much different. In the word fescue, I have a feeling it's going to ra- raise its head. And fescue, that's a product of the University of Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. Well, fescue's not, but the type of fescue that we see, they call it Kentucky 31, right. is a product of Kentucky. And it was you know, engineered at University of Kentucky for soil erosion purposes. And um, it works. It, it did work. It worked very well. And it not only worked for soil erosion, but farmers found out that they could graze their cattle on it pretty much year-round, and it would persist. So it had those two great characteristics. So when you drive down the highway and you see a hay field, is that fescue? Pretty much, yes. It may look well and good, but if you're an animal, if you're a quail, you're a rabbit, if you're an animal that used to live there hundreds of years ago when it wasn't these things, how has a field changed? Some of the early pioneers that came to the state talked about riding through the state and actually having to stand on the backs of horses to see over the grasses. So you're talking grasses that were you know, six, eight feet tall in many cases, maybe taller. Um, so tall that a man riding on a horse couldn't see over the top of them. Well, that was the historic grassland. Why would you choose that route? Why would you even do that? Was that the best way to to get from point A to B, to ride through grass at six feet high? Well, I guess so. There were lots of different reasons. They were exploring. They were going from point A to point B. You know, I don't know all the reasons they were traveling through, but it was, you know, it was a different habitat in a completely different environment at the time. But it, it wasn't like they were riding through a hay field. These were grasses of a different variety. Dif- right. What did they look like versus a hay field? Well, again, they were tall. They tend to be what we call bunch grasses, so they grow from a kind of a clump and then they reach many of them reach great heights. They're species like big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, all can grow six feet or taller. Um, there were other smaller species as well, things like little blue stem, side oats. Uh, there were some cool season grasses, rise and different things like that. There's some question on whether the bluegrass state had any bluegrass at all, actually, or whether that was completely brought over from Europe. Early settlers, as they came in, utilized those grasses uh, for cattle, for all their livestock. And again, they were flat. In many cases, they were flat, and they could be changed from grasses to agriculture. You talk about bunch grasses. I'm going to try to draw a picture of this. Let's say you were looking at a bouquet of flowers in a vase. So at the the base of this vase, let's say, is uh, four or five inches around. But at the top, the top of it may be a couple of feet wide or so. That's 
the way that these native grasses would grow, these bunch grasses, that they're tight at the bottom and then they right. grow up and bloom out and spread out. So underneath of all that, there's a lot of open ground. Right. And so the bunches spread themselves out so that, again, like you'd said, you know, quail, um, rabbits, uh, different types of birds and things that utilize the ground can move in between those clumps of grasses then. And they're protected from overhead because they've got this broader canopy, if you will, for a grass, and so predators can't see them from above, and so they have a nice, safe environment to walk through. An umbrella of sorts. Yeah, very much so. We're talking with wildlife expert Dan Feigert about wildlife and habitat and how it has changed as Kentucky has changed. We'll have more in our next segment. I'm Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio. We go inside outdoors today with Dan Feigert, a wildlife specialist and assistant director of the Kentucky Division of Wildlife. We're talking about what may sound like a lecture in biology class, but if you hang with us, we're talking about the nuts and bolts and the fundamentals of the fields around us, where wildlife live and where more and a greater variety lived once upon a time, before people came along and changed so much of what we see. Mr. Feigert, before the break, the subject was how hayfields have taken over grasslands that were native to our state and pretty much in the process changed everything. Hay and fescue are the grasses of today by and large, but the grasses of yesteryear were much more beneficial to animals. So they would eat the weeds. They would eat the seeds that are produced there. Many bugs would end up utilizing the, the forbs, and so many of the birds would eat the bugs. So you've got a whole system that's created there that is different than what we have now with the fescue. It's kind of hard for a rabbit to make do or a quail to make do, well, and, it, and numbers will, will reflect that. Right, and, and while some are able to make do, you don't have the basic landscape structure out there to support the kinds of populations that you once did. Anytime you're going to change the habitat as significantly as going from these native warm season grasses, these tall bunch grasses with lots of forbs and lots of diversity, into a monoculture of fescue, which is a kind of what we call a carpet grass. It, yeah. It's a mat across the carpet. You know, if you try to roll a tennis ball in between fescue, you can't. It's there's fescue everywhere. Um, where you could roll a tennis ball easily between these bunch grasses and these forbs that were growing. So you've completely changed the structure, and you can only expect that the wildlife are going to react to that many different ways. The bugs are going to be different. They're not going to be able to walk between those grasses, so they're going to avoid those areas now instead of going to those same areas that were grasses before, but different grasses. Um, it, it changes everything. But I think what people don't understand is that these systems evolved over you know, millennia to get to the point where they were at. And the wildlife and the bugs and the whole systems created or changed and slowly evolved to adapt to these characteristics. And when we came through and changed things as, as quickly and radically as we did, the wildlife just can't change that fast. They so. cannot evolve with the pace that we would like them to. Right, I guess that's And the Industrial Revolution, and we're talking 1800s, we had to see quite the loss. That means out of balance. Right. Back to these three pages of notes. From what I'm seeing, we have bounced all over the sheets <laughs> already, and I don't mind that. Here in the United States... It's called the North American Model for Wildlife Conservation and the Public Trust Doctrine. And talks about wildlife belongs to no one. It belongs to you and me. It belongs to the right. kid on the skateboard. It belongs, it, it belongs to no one, but it belongs to everyone. That's the unique thing about America. And we were really the ones who developed this model, from my understanding. And for the first time, wildlife... It does not belong to who owns the property, but it belongs to the greater good. There were some court cases back in the 1800s where the Supreme Court decided a landowner said he owned the mussels that were in his stream. And the court said, you know, not really. They belong to the state. By the state, they meant the people of the state. 
And so when they did that, it really, for the first time of my knowledge, changed the way ownership of wildlife occurred up to that point. You know, if you go back to Europe and places like that, whoever owned the land pretty much owned the wildlife. If they wanted to protect it, they did. If they wanted to kill it, they did. If they wanted to try to change it, they could do it. But in America, all of a sudden, that changed. And it no longer belonged to the landowner, but it belonged to the people. And so that was a a real pivotal point for wildlife in, in our country. Because up to that point, you had... You had market hunting that was really driving wildlife populations. And at the time, there was, you know, an unlimited, what seemed to be an unlimited source of buffalo and and passenger pigeons. And, you know, all these different wildlife species were just limitless, so they thought. When you have those types of resources, people in America, being ingenuitive as they were, began to utilize those resources, and they began to, you know, harvest, and there were no laws to protect them or no laws to slow them down, so they, you know, market hunting led. If they could sell it and get a price for it, they killed it and took what they could and sold it. I've seen pictures where market hunters would go out and they would get X amount for every wolf he brought in or X amount for every deer or every turkey, and they would just harvest well, all the live long day, as I recall, but based on looking at these photographs. Well, that's that's what you're talking about. It's a bounty for like a wolf. There was no real commercial value for a wolf other than the hide. Yes, that's true. And so, yeah, they would kill them whenever they could. There was really no concern for trying to protect the population. They were just trying to kill them before somebody else could go kill them, um, and they could make the money off of them instead of someone else. And so, again, in the 1800s, when these judges decided that the wildlife belonged to all the people of the state, then all of a sudden we began to see laws to protect those species so that they could be perpetuated for future generations. And you couldn't just go out and kill all of them you wanted because now they were beginning to see that we need to put limits on these because they're not limitless. I have noticed in reading up on the North American model for wildlife conservation that the word science is used, that science is the proper tool for developing policies concerning habitat and wildlife and fisheries. And science is one of those words, for a science to be a science, it has to use measurement. If you do X, what does that do to the population? Does it get get Y response? Yeah, you get X, you get Y response. But it has to be able to be measured. But population right. changes by weight, by you, you name it, however, whatever right. the unit of measurement is, right. you can actually, well, we did this and we had Y. And we did that, we had Z. But, but you're using scientific tools to do what we do today other than, oh, it's out there, let's kill it. Or let's out there, let's harvest it and use the feathers. It's a hard science. I guess calling wildlife biology a science is a little tricky because, you know, you get back to those measurables, and it's hard to measure the exact response you're always going to have. You can say, in many cases, if we go out and we kill this many deer, our population is going to go up or down, but we might not be able to say by exactly how much. You can quantify it based on trends, Yes. and I know that wildlife biology certainly works on trend data. Yes. And and that's true. Many times that's the best we can do. It's not that you can't measure it, but if you did measure all of it, by the nature of measuring it, you would be almost eliminating it sometimes. To, so to, to go out and count every deer, the best way to do that would be to either round them up, or to, and you can't do that. So we do estimates. There is no Facebook for deer. <laughs> that's true. There is no Facebook for bald eagles. There is no global or statewide registry right. for these animals, but you do have ways to measure them or at least guesstimate fairly accurately. Yes, and we know things are getting better or getting worse for just about all the species at this point because we're able to monitor and quantify to some level. A leads to B, and if you know if there's a drought and there's not much mast, meaning not many acorns produced, right? you're going to have fewer squirrels. Right. It's that simple, and we're talking about that interconnectivity of nature. Right. That That's one thing you can depend on. Well, it was a drought, so you know. You can expect to see a drop in harvest numbers, maybe even uh, hunting license sales. Not sure. We all like to go into the garage and tinker, take something apart. And we know if we take the lawnmower apart, there are no wasted parts. There are no unusable parts. They're all there for a reason. 
and we know if we put the lawnmower together and have a couple extra parts left over, we did something wrong, and it's probably not going to work as well as before we took it apart. Now, this tinkering isn't something new to the garage. This has been around since early, what, 1900s with Aldo Leopold, right. a great conservationist. He was in Wisconsin, but he came up with this concept of tinkering. How does that apply to the natural world? Well, and his thought was, we don't understand all the interactions that are out there. Nature is every bit as complicated as a, as a working motor and a lawnmower or a vehicle of any kind. Um, and the interconnectivity of everything is, is pretty dramatic. So if we take a piece of, of that environment out, whether it be an animal, we've killed them all, or uh, even a plant that is part of that working engine, if you will, in the environment, we really don't know what kind of impact that is necessarily going to have. But we do know one thing, it's probably going to have an impact. It's all just as connected as your engine is. Every part of the environment is connected just like every part of an engine is connected. And, you know, he said that the, uh, and I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but basically, you know, anybody who's a good tinkerer knows that you need every piece. And if you end up with extra pieces at the end or there's pieces that don't make it back in, it's not going to work right. There are no useless parts. That's right. And so basically his philosophy was if there's any part of nature that you take out, you're probably going to have consequences and that system is not going to work as well. Dan, we have a fishing report coming up and a break we need to take. But when we come back, I want to hear examples of pieces that have gone missing from the system right here in Kentucky and what those consequences have been. This is Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Baglin back. We're into our second half hour here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Upcoming, we have a show about BB guns. It's kind of cool. We got the idea from a listener who said he'd always had an interest in these guns, but wanted to know more. So we got a fella who is the recipient of the Distinguished Rifleman Award. He knows a lot about guns. He has competed nationally and with pellet rifles. If you'd like to give us your suggestions, it's easy to do on Facebook, Kentucky, a field radio. Like us, and you'll like us. It's time now for our fishing report. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. District lake temperatures are running in the low to mid-80s. However, black bass fishing around the area is very good, especially at Taylorsville, Harrington, and Giss Creek Lake. Try topwater action during early morning and late evening hours at these lakes, as well as crankbait fishing or fishing plastics around shoreline cover. Catfishing at Taylorsville is picking up. Fish cut shad in 8 to 15 foot of water along creek channel or river channel edges. Channel catfish are up on the flats where the blue cats are schooling in the river channel. And finally, I'm receiving good reports of good catches of smallmouth and rock bass being caught in many local area streams, such as Elkhorn or Floyd's Fork. Remember always to ask permission when entering private property. Hope to see you on the water. This is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Report. Stream and river reports coming in better now with most streams clearing up from the recent muddy water. Catfish are being reported hitting from nests in the rivers and providing hand fishing action. Smallmouth bass hitting small jigs, plastics well. Russell Fork, Pike County is also having some larger rock bass caught, 10 to 12 inches. Catfishing reports on larger lakes have been good with rod and reel jugs and hand fishing. Dewey, buckhorn, and fish trap producing good numbers of channels and flatheads. That bait and chicken liver working as well. Also, some bluegill being found out a good distance from shoreline, but grouped on shallow mud flats, the Gatesville buckhorn and fish trap lakes. The small farm ponds are producing good bass fishing during the daytime hours, the present, with plastic worms. Hi, this is John Williams with a fish report for Southeast Kentucky. As we get into summer, that means walleye fishing in our major reservoirs. Once a thermocline forms, you should find walleye in Lake Cumberland and Laurel Lake anywhere from 15 to 20 feet deep. Bottom bouncing is a popular method of catching those. Pull a night crawler rig with spinner blades behind a bottom bouncer, like I say, 15 to 20 feet deep on main lake points and cuts. Also, if you can find a submerged island that tops out around 20 feet, that's a good place to start. They can also be caught on crankbait. 
baits, tried slow trolling, a variety of mid-depth running crankbaits. And finally, also in the district, uh, we have a variety of river systems that are good for float trips, Upper Cumberland River, Rock Castle, uh, Buck Creek. Try floating those for smallmouth, rock bass, and a variety of sunfish. As always, good luck and good fishing. This is Kentucky Field Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin. And the missing pieces in the puzzle of wildlife. More with our expert, Dan Feigert, after the break. Skipper! 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 I don't know what you mean by skipper. Skipper? Skipper! 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 Hey, skipper! What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets? You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you. Your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, Skipper, don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is Kentucky Field Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin. And Kentucky, more specifically the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, over the last 20 or so years has worked to restore some of the animals that we have lost to overhunting, lost to loss of habitat, for example, bald eagles was one we had a hand in nationally, peregrine falcons, elk, before that deer, wild turkey. One critter that got some really good press was the river otter. And Dan Feigert, assistant director of the Kentucky Division of Wildlife, let's talk about the river otter. When that left our rivers and streams, that led to what? Well, there was, you know, primarily they eat fish, so you can right away say the fish populations could likely change in certain ways. Were there certain fish that they ate more than others? Were there other animals that ate river otters? Were there, you know, you you begin to look at what kind of impacts each animal has that are in that system. Did other animals depend on the river otter to do things? Did the river otter, did for the fish populations, did the river otter help keep fish populations healthy by taking certain sick fish or the fish that it could catch you know happened to sometimes be sick or unhealthy and so or maybe one had a shorter fin like in the the Nemo movie those fish are probably more vulnerable so what happens is those get taken out of the population and you keep a very fit very healthy fish population because river otters are making sure that that's the case or helping making sure that's the case you know mussels freshwater mussels are a great example because they are so interconnected, and we're just beginning to understand some of the ways that they're connected. Let's describe what, an, what a freshwater mussel is. This sort of looks like a clamshell. If you see a dry stream bed and you find right. these, look, what are these seashells doing? Here? Right. Those are freshwater clams. That's right. And their purpose is? Well, they filter water, but their life cycle is, is very interconnected with that whole aquatic system. Because they're filter feeders, they basically eat the little structures that are within the water that, you know, microscopic that we can't even see, but that's what they're feeding on. Because of that, they're great indicators of whether your water table is healthy and clean or not, because there's changes that occur that we can't see that the mussel is living on. You would think they're a fairly boring species. They sit at the bottom of a stream and they filter feed. They're not colorful, they're not dramatic, but they impact that whole aquatic system they change the qualities of the water. They depend on that. Their life cycles are tied into the fish. When a, a mussel sends out its microscopic babies, they have to land in the gills of fish to develop that first life cycle stage. And then they fall off into the muck in the, in the stream, and then they grow from there. But without the right fish, they might not be able to reproduce. Um, with poor water quality, they might not be able to survive. Um, they're fairly durable, and they're used to certain types of events, but there's certain things that keep them from reproducing and continuing that life cycle. For example, they, when it's time for them to reproduce, they'll put out a little uh, thing out of their shell that, that tickles back and forth in the water and almost appears to be like a prey fish or, or something that the fish that they want to shoot their little babies into their gills, it looks like the food that they're going to eat. And so, you know, you never know that without a, a pretty in-depth understanding of these things. And so they'll sit in the water and they'll use the water flow to move it back and forth. And it looks like the food and then the fish comes down and picks at it. And then poof, the babies are shot into the gills of that fish. And so 
It doesn't help or hurt the fish, but it helps perpetuate the life cycle of the mussel. And without those host fish, there are no, no new mussels coming down the pike. That's right. And some are very selective to a particular type of fish. Some are more generalist. Uh, but it's incredible the diversity of mussels. We have more mussel species in you know, the Green River than they have in all of Europe. And it's, again, because we've had a healthier system and we've taken care of our resources better than probably they have in Europe. We ought to look at, well, how did all that begin to change? And I'm going to, I don't know the date, but I'm going to guess 1940s, 50 post-war, when uh, many dams were being built. My understanding is that you know, you put a dam in, it changes the flow of water below that stream in ways that we don't fully understand. For example, you have a, a rain in the water table somewhere and you have a bit of a flood and it creates the right structure. You put a dam in and you've now changed the pattern of how a flood occurs in that system. So you get different types of riffles, different types of runs, different structures within the stream or not you know, the stream structure starts to change, where maybe before you had a much more braided channel, you have a a main channel now instead of, and you have much more consistent water flow. Water coming out of the dam now um, is often different temperature, and many of these mussels depend on the temperature of the water to know when they were supposed to reproduce, for example. So um, they would use water temperature as a cue for them to know when to do certain things. And now the water temperature maybe stays the same because the water's coming from the bottom of this big dam and you never warm up to the levels that you used to warm up to prior to the dam being there. Um, also, it can change the amount of sediment that comes through. Um, it changes the whole dynamics of the stream system. There was a show I did where a fellow from the Fish and Wildlife Service was talking about the importance of the Endangered Species Act. And he says, just because we don't know what the impact of something is today doesn't mean we won't know what it is tomorrow. And it could be something that could change your life. Uh, Medicines, for example. He said that there was a tree out in Oregon, in uh, Washington, that was considered a weed tree. As science later found out, that it contained taxol, very useful in cervical cancer. And so, while it may have been a weed tree to you and me, uh, the medical industry and people with the cervical cancer, they kind of like it. And so you just never know. Just because it's 21st century doesn't mean we know everything about everything. And the types of research that are occurring today that we do, you know, are not necessarily based on medicine, but trying to better understand the biology of the animals. Bear are back in Kentucky for the first time in hundreds of years. How those are impacting the environment, you know, we're only beginning to understand. Um, We're trying to basically just get a handle on what our bear population is doing, where it's occurring, how many cubs our females are having, those types of basic things. You've got to understand the basics before you can begin to develop um, understandings of the more complicated issues that are out there. How are bears impacting our oak environments in the eastern mountains where they occur? We know that they eat a lot of, of mast. Um, are they impacting the turkeys because they're eating the mass before the turkeys can? Uh, you know, those types of questions, it's just a limitless number of questions that you can begin to look at um, after you start to have a few answers. It just, there's more questions out there that seem to pop up all the time. Let's talk a minute about exotic invasive plants. The word exotic sounds like it's wonderful. There's a magic, <laughs> there's an intrigue to something exotic. Exotic music or dancers or flowers or whatever that is exotic has to be wonderful. <laughs> Not necessarily. There are critters here that shouldn't be here. And because they have come here, Asian carp, for example, in the, in the Mississippi River system. Starlings. What keeps them in check in their homeland didn't come with them. Right. And to bring those things over here may even create an even bigger mess. We've got right. sort of a different ecology right. here, and that applies to wherever you go on the planet. Right. Things are going to be different. Right. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Systems evolved together. You take a piece out of one system and plunk it in a different system, and whatever kept that one species in check no longer necessarily exists in this new environment. It might be ideal growing environment for it and it might do very well Um, and and that's really what we begin to get at when we call it an invasive exotic it's exotic it doesn't belong here and it's invasive that means it just it reproduces without check and so 
what can happen is it can outcompete many of the native plants, for example, that occur there. And so all of a sudden you have, like kudzu, a plant that has no native control species anymore, and it just goes crazy. It's a great living environment for it. It grows, you know, over everything and, and begins to kill out everything and completely change the environment. So for us, an in- invasive exotic is not a good thing. That's one of the reasons, if anyone travels internationally, when you're coming into port, they will ask you, there's a question here, have you been on any farmland? Right. Do you have mud in your cleats? That's right. Because you never know what's in there. Dirt from another land may bring disease into this land that just doesn't fit. Right. And so that's one of the reasons for that. A great example that's basically occurring now is this white nose syndrome. It's a fungus, and we think it came from Europe somewhere. Uh, there's a very, very similar fungus that occurs in Europe, in caves in Europe. We think that there were people who went in caves in Europe and came over here, maybe had on the same boots and went to a cave up in New York State. The fungus did very well in the cave in New York State, and um, it impacted the bats that were wintering in that cave, and it, it basically grew on their face. Now, bat biology is kind of complicated. Um, they hibernate in the winter. So they go in these caves that are a very consistent temperature. Their body temperature reduces. They go into a torpor that very difficult to come out of for them. It takes energy to come out of it. So they go and they sleep all winter. Um, bats in this country rely strictly on bugs to eat primarily. So in the winter, there's no bugs out, so they can't feed. So they go into these caves. They spend the winters in the caves. In the spring, when the bugs come back out, they come back out. They start feeding, and everything's fine. What happens is this fungus begins to grow on them in these caves. It started in New York. It's growing now. It's in Kentucky as well. And so um, when that happens, the bat gets irritated by the fungus and starts trying to clean it off. It wakes up in the middle of the winter, flies out. There's no bugs to eat. And now the bat's got a real problem um, because there's nothing to eat. It's awake, and basically it's going to die. So this white nose syndrome came across. We don't exactly know how. We don't exactly know where, but it got in our caves in Kentucky, and it's killing all our bats. And, again, bats are one of those species who cares about bats, but bats, they eat a lot of insects. They eat a lot of insects that are detrimental to our row crops. So they can have some pretty big impacts. And again, you take a bat, take a piece out of that puzzle, and we don't know, again, you go back to the tinker, you're taking a piece out, we don't know how it's going to impact the system now. I'll tell you this, if you don't like a mosquito, I would say you would love a bat. (laughs) They love to eat skeeters. They love to eat me. More point-blank questions for our man Dan in the next segment. What good is a snake? What good is a mouse? Stay tuned to Kentucky Field Radio. Kentucky Field Radio, we are back in our last segment with Dan Feigert. Danny, I bet you know somebody, as I know my sister, who has a degree in biology, yet she will say, ooh, why do we need a snake? Ooh, why do we need snails? Why do we need you know this and that? So let me just rifle some questions off at you. What good is a snake? They're going to eat a lot of mice and things like that. Again, help keep those mouse populations in check and keep them healthy. So they eat mice. Sure. We don't like mice. A mouse. Well, what good are they? They feed hawks. <laughs> they feed hawks. They uh, are the building blocks for a lot of the species out there as far as a food. You know, everything eats a mouse because they're small. A lot of different types of things eat mice. Snakes, owls, um, hawks, um, you know, all, anything that will eat meat, basically foxes, coyotes. I mean, you name it, they'll all eat mice if they can catch one. Uh, again, they're touching a lot of different populations out there and if you took all the mice away it would cause some pretty significant and unknown results north american model of wildlife conservation that's what we follow in north america canada as well Uh, states allow sustainable use of sport fish and wildlife by law based on science means you use a little mathematics in there logic and reasoning Public has input on how these resources are allocated. I'm just reading off this list. Right. We're a state agency. That means we work for the people. You know, our job is to promote wildlife or to protect wildlife, but it's to protect wildlife for the Commonwealth. 
So for the people of the state. So our job is to make sure that there are eagles and mice and snakes available today and that those populations are maintained not only for our use and, and enjoyment, but for future generations. And like you said, who knows what kinds of benefits we're going to gain from You know, maybe there's a type of mouse out there that we really don't like that much, but it has a certain fungus or something growing on it we won't discover for another 50 years. But if we take that mouse out of the system, we'll never discover it, and that cure for eczema or whatever it might be will never be discovered because it's gone. You've been a wildlife biologist for 25 years or more? (laughs) A little more. (laughs) Are we doing a good job, and I say we as a people, as a nation? We have lots of successes, I'll say. Um, If you look in Kentucky, for example, when I was a kid growing up in Kentucky, it was extremely rare to see a deer track. Now, you see deer everywhere. You know, there were no turkeys where I grew up in Kentucky. Um, Now, there are turkeys everywhere across the state. Um, We've brought elk back. We've got eagles at probably higher populations than they've ever occurred since the early days. We've got peregrine falcons back in our state. We've got a lot of successes that we have done great job with. We've got failures too. Um, We're always striving to try to do better and to try to find better ways to do what we do. But uh, so the challenge is always there, but we're, we've got plenty of successes that we can build on, I feel like. I'll, I'll say this. There's a fellow we knew in common many years ago who was the director of the Division of Wildlife and he said something to me that was so profound. I will I think back, it was during the years of river otter restoration in mm-hmm. Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing noisier or stinkier than a river otter. They're cute, see them floating down the stream. But when they're in a cage ready to be uh, transported to wherever these streams were, where they were going to be released to. You realize they're wildlife. <laughs> they are noisy. And... Do they smell? But he and I were standing there by probably a dozen of these things. And he looked at me and he said, Bagman, he had a big smile on his face. He said, wouldn't you like to know what they know, whatever that might be? Mm-hmm. I've just never forgotten that. He was he had insight that, you know, he looked at things from a little different perspective sometimes. He was a great man. But you look at a tree, and a tree's been there for maybe 150, 200 years the changes that that tree has seen since it was young. You know, that goes back to another Aldo Leopold story about, you know, he and his son are are cutting through a tree and going through those annual rings. And he's kind of thinking about the history that that tree has seen standing there. It's, It's incredible. And the knowledge that all critters have kind of in their DNA, they don't process it like we do. They're not smart like we are. But at the same time, their whole history has put them there and to have that knowledge of all those years of making it through the system and making it through the environment to have the knowledge of any species it'd be pretty incredible it's not nice to fool mother nature no she's much smarter than we are i have to change the subject do you text and drive i try not to my daughter doesn't let me much appreciate your help well i hope i was able to do a little something good okay doc very good class dismissed We've got a minute or two left in the show. Time for a good dog story. A lady, Yolanda, has a neighbor named Stacy. And uh, Yolanda knocked on Stacy's door one morning and asked if uh, her neighbor would mind keeping an eye on a lost terrier that she had found roaming around the local elementary school. And Yolanda agreed. The two women took photos of the dog. They printed it off. They made 4,000 We Found a Dog flyers, claim if he's yours, stuff them in mailboxes, put them on Craigslist, the whole shebang. Now, in the meantime, Yolanda went to the dollar store, and she bought some pet supplies, warning her two sons the dog visiting was only temporary. Now, at the time, Yolanda's son was 10, another son, 21 years old, uh, also had Down syndrome. Four days later, Yolanda was still looking after the dog. By that time, they had given the dog a name of Riley. And when she arrived home one day, the dog flung himself against the screen door and barked his head off. Riley sprinted to the boy's bedroom where Yolanda had found Christian, again the 21-year-old, in the middle of a violent seizure. Riley ran over to Christian, but just as soon as Yolanda bent over to help, the dog went silent. Later in the hospital, Yolanda was talking and said if the dog 
hadn't come to get me, the neurologist said, Christian would have choked on his own blood and would have died. Yolanda took the story to the Tampa Bay Times, and at this point no one had yet come to claim the dog. So Yolanda had decided to keep the dog. The next morning, Stacy got a call from a man named Randy, and he recognized his dog from the newspaper article. And at that point, Stacy started crying and said, You know that dog? He saved my friend's son's life. Randy drove over to Yolanda's house. He wanted to pick his dog up, but he saw how attached the two boys were to the little dog, and he said, I appreciate you finding my dog, but in all actuality, I think that it was he who was supposed to find you. Just proves again, without a shadow of a doubt, there is nothing better than a dog. We're out of time. Join us again in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again, right here on Kentucky Field Radio.